Richie. Hi, Sin. Hi, everyone. Richie, I would like our listeners to do a meditation exercise with us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'd like everyone to close their eyes. Imagine you're on the beach. The waves are hitting your feet. Is Red Grape going to show up again? <laughs> you already know who's here. This is a surprise for the viewers. That's why their eyes are closed, Richie, not yours. You just announced on Twitter who you were recording with. Tutu, do you see what I have to deal with? Uh, yes, I guess. <laughs> Hi, Tutu. Hello. Not hi, Richie, because you already bullied me today and you ruined this intro. Am I supposed to defend him or should I just pretend that I hate him too? <laughs> also, this is all genuine. Like, I, I have no idea who is showing up anymore. No, you knew about this specific instance. Yeah. Uh, you know about one more specific instance that's scheduled, but the one yeah. after that, you don't know. Okay, okay, thank you. You're welcome. So don't exaggerate, you know some things that are happening. Hi, Bear. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> welcome, Tutu. Thank you, thank you. I feel the pressure to be on such a well-regarded podcast, but I am going to do my best not to ruin the quality of the content. So that we'll we'll manage that. We are going to discuss the PC RPG Baldur's Gate, as befits our guest, who is an expert on computer RPGs. Excellent. I feel the pressure now that you've said expert. <laughs> <laughs> as Richard mentioned, Baldur's Gate uh, is a PC RPG. It was published. In 1998, by Black Isle Studios. Uh, so, Black Isle Studios was technically both a publishing and a development division of Interplay Entertainment, and it was specialized in role playing games. So, you might have seen their logo on a lot of RPGs that they developed, but in the case of Baldur's Gate, they mostly offered support on the publishing side. And the developer that worked on Baldur's Gate was Bioware. Now, in my notes, what I have written is, I know who they are, no need for notes. But I imagine some in our audience might disagree. So uh, just to kind of keep it short, Bioware uh, is a developer that has been very well known for, the wor for their work in the RPG genre. They started with Baldur's Gate in terms of RPGs. And eventually they ended up working on games like uh, Knights of the Old Republic, uh, Mass Effect, and Dragon Age. And for a very long time, they, I would say they have been like, considered like, in the top five best studios for RPGs. They've, they've always gotten a pretty big hate dom, like some people just hate them. Yeah. But uh, the fandom for a very long time has been bigger recently. I don't know that it's still like that because both Mass Effect and Andromeda and Anthem haven't been released very well. I haven't played them, so this is no judgment on those games. It's just uh, it's just what I have seen in the community. But yeah, yeah, for a for a very long time, and I don't know what the future will say, but uh, they've been known as a as a great RPG studio. But back when they made Baldur's Gate, they had never developed. Uh, an RPG before. Hmm. So, uh, I could mention, by the way, uh, or I can leave it for later, that, Bal that Bioware had already developed a game before, which was uh, Shattered Steel. Um, it was a mech simulator released in 1996. It uh, was released... Uh, um, sorry, it was received, I would say, well, but not super well. Right. Its competitors were more famous and just had a uh, better reach uh, to their audience and their audience preferred. Yeah, so it, it would have been competing against, like, Mech Warrior. Yeah, exactly. Official battle tech stuff, yeah. Um, I guess, like, I guess we could talk about, like, our first 
experiences with it, like when we first played it, and like I guess what our history with like other RPGs and D and D was at the time. Mm-hmm. So like, um, I guess like we'll start with you. Like, did you know much about or play D and D before you played Baldur's Gate? So for me, it was the opposite, to be honest. Like, Baldur's Gate is what got me into D&D instead of D&D getting me into Baldur's Gate. And I think this is true right. for a lot of people. Yeah. So how I got into Baldur's Gate is kind of funny. Uh, because what happened is I played Ultima Online in middle school. And that's already when Ultima Online was kind of waning in popularity and other MMORPGs like EverQuest were starting to become popular. But I got into Ultima Online, and I played it a whole bunch with a couple of friends in middle school. Um, so um, a friend who played Ultima Online with me basically recommended Baldur's Gate to me on... Uh, uh, the way he put it was, Baldur's Gate is basically like Ultima Online but single player, which is funny because, of course, you would think Ultima Online but single player is an Ultima game. <laughs> but yeah. that's how that's how Baldur's Gate was introduced to me. And so, yeah, I played it the first time in middle school. I don't remember finishing it back then, although I probably got close. I was really bad at the game. Uh, then eventually, I played Baldur's Gate too. And even though I was bad at Baldur's Gate 2, too, I enjoyed it a lot more. And in high school, I picked it up again, Baldur's Gate. And this time I actually finished it, and then I also finished Baldur's Gate 2. I did a whole franchise playthrough. So it's something that I've replayed multiple times throughout the years, um, until recently. And uh, every time I've replayed it, I got a little better at the game, even though uh, I'm not one of those people that do, like, Iron Man solo playthroughs. That's not something that has ever appealed to me personally. Um, but that's that's kind of how I got into Baldur's Gate. And eventually in high school, I got into Dungeons & Dragons through uh, third edition, or I guess 3.5, technically. Yeah, yeah um, I... Had I was familiar with the D and D rules basically because I'd played a lot of shareware D and D clone RPGs, which sort of just copied the rule set basically word for word. Mm-hmm. Um, lots of dungeon crawlers, uh, also like games like Wizardry that copied D and D quite closely. So I I was familiar with the rules. I had the rule books, but I had never played it at that point. I just sort of bought them because I was into other tabletop games at the time. Mm-hmm. And I cannot rem- I got Baldur's Gate around the time it came out. I don't think I ran to grab it. I think I just saw, like, oh, this is a big new fancy RPG. It'll take a lot of time because I liked RPGs a lot as a kid. And, um, yeah, sitting down to actually, like, play it was a bit of a- an odd experience for me because I hadn't really played anything like it. I had played D&D clones and D&D games in the past, but they'd all been dungeon crawlers, where you basically just rolled a party and then ran around in a dungeon. Mm -hmm. And Baldur's Gate was a much more fully featured, like, this is actually a story that you're playing through. You have a defined central character that you have to create, but then you will acquire other party members along the way, and they can, like, leave you, and they can have their own side quests. And it it was much more sort of controlled and scripted, Mm -hmm. what you were going through. Yeah. And it um, at some point it did kind of railroad where you were going, and I hadn't yeah I hadn't really played anything like it before. Um, I got pretty into it. I again like um, like you, I didn't finish it because I kept restarting it because I'd have new ideas for characters. Yeah, and then I so I just delete my save and start the again. classic RPG plague. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and um, I eventually did finish it, and then I actually did do like you said, I did do a solo run of Baldur's Gate. Um, that was actually the last time I played it. It would have been like four or five years ago. I, I found my old CDs and they still worked. And I thought, I wonder if you can solo this. And it turns out that you can see most of it. If you like really hyper-specialize everything, you can get most mm-hmm. of the content without any party members. Yeah. Yeah. It's, there's actually a thriving community 
uh, around Baldur's Gate that really likes to uh, challenge themselves with like solo playthroughs or uh, placing restrictions on their party or with mods that alter the difficulty. Um, it's interesting because, of course, the Snap Covenant co covers mostly uh, like Dark Souls and Bloodborne, and there are a lot of similarities in how some players yeah. have approached the games, even though the games themselves are very, very different. And Reborn. Yes, and Reborn. I mean, Baldur's Gate has a lot of one-note characters too, so I guess there's that that makes it <laughs> similar to Reborn. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! Oh my god! Did did Tutu really just say that? Did Tutu throw shade at Reborn out of all things? I don't think we can include this in case Marvelous delete the podcast. <laughs> we'll have to remove this bit. The redacted anime. <laughs> The famous anime and manga that we cannot mention. <laughs> In my defense, again, I, I have never read Reborn, uh, but I did. I really was into Naruto when I was in high school, so I have my own shame. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Sorry. Oh, oh, we were talking about our experiences. So, like, you, I don't think, have played this, but you apparently, like, watched a bit of a Let's Play of it? Yeah, I watched a bit of a Let's Play. Um, I watched, yeah. like, other people reviewing the game and talking about it. And apparently it's not just one game. Apparently there's a lot of things. It seems a little complicated. And there's spin-offs. And just a lot of information, so it's just like, whatever, I'm going to take a nap. Tutu's got this. <laughs> okay. Good. Okay. Good. But so I, it is true. Um, no, sorry. Sorry. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. I Well, I guess when we talk about the game, I'll tell you the stuff I thought was cute. But yeah, go on. There, there, is, a, there is a reborn connection here, though. Go on. Because, no, you know, you asked me, like you were asking me about D&D &D one day, and you said... Um, can I, you were like, hey, you've played D&D, &D. and I was like, yeah, and you were like, oh, can you tell me how to make a character like this, and you gave me all these really, really oddly specific things. <laughs> really? And then I'm like, is this Hibari from Reborn? And you're like, yeah. I literally don't remember this, but that's a very good idea. Good you wanted to know how to make Hibari from Reborn in D&D. &D. <laughs> this actually reminds me of something that happened to me in high school. Were you the leader of the disciplinary committee? Uh, no, I don't think we had a disciplinary this whatever <laughs> that committee. Mm -hmm. I don't think we had that in high school. I don't. I think Italian high school and Japanese high schools work very, very differently. So no, <laughs> I was more thinking about the idea of making a D and D character inspired by anime. I was the designated DM when it came. Basically, DM, uh, if you have never played D&D, &D, it's the abbreviation for Dungeon Master, the, the person that kind of comes up with a narrative and adjudicates what's going on in the game. And one of my friends and a member of our D&D &D group at the time really, really wanted his monk uh, to be like R Rock Lee, the character from Naruto. And at the time, I was a bad DM. I really cared about the tone of my game. <laughs> and I was like, no, you cannot do that. That's, that's too anime. You cannot. <laughs> and that's, that's what I was reminded of. Oh, you were reminded of your past regrets. To be fair, I don't really regret that. I didn't <laughs> want that character in my game. <laughs> Okay, maybe it's better if we talk about Baldur's Gate again. <laughs> so, so Sin, what did you um, what did you glean from? I guess the the gameplay that you saw of Baldur's Gate. Okay, well, it's a clickbait. Correct. But not like Fallout clickbait. It's more of um, uh, oh my god, Warcraft. Yes. Yeah, it's it's a very like. If you sit down to play it, it's quite strange because it's in real time, but 
there's an option, but it's still using turns from the D and D rules. So it's this really odd hybrid system, and you can actually set a a uh, an option in the menu to make it pause every turn. Mm-hmm. So I remember um, when I first got it, I showed it to a friend of mine who did play A D and D, and he was like, "This is in real time. It sucks." And he just wouldn't play it because it was in real time, and he thought that like diluted the the approach of D and D because like. The previous D&D games, like we were talking before um, off mic about there were a series of games called the Gold Box games that were also official D&D products, but they were all turn-based and they used like a grid setup. Whereas looking at Baldur's Gate, it looks a lot like you're playing Warcraft and that you have this like top-down view and you're sort of ordering your characters around by clicking on them and then clicking on something else and they will walk over to it or attack it Mm -hmm. or something like that. Yeah, it was, uh, so Baldur's Gate was not the first game that I know that utilized that system. In role-playing circles, it's usually abbreviated to RTWP, basically real-time with pause. Uh, But it was the game that popularized that system. There weren't a lot of RPGs that used a similar combat system before Baldur's Gate, and there was a ton of them after the release of Baldur's Gate. Some of them directly because they ran on the same technology as Baldur's Gate. And some of them because they just copied the combat system. It became, for a very long time, the standard for D&D games and PC RPGs in general. Now things are kind of swinging back. Now with the success of games like uh, Divinity Original Sin, um, it's... uh, There is a Baldur's Gate 3, for example, that is under development by the same studio, the Divinity Original Sin, and uh, they haven't explained what the combat system is going to be like, but it's very likely that it's going to be turn-based, which is a first for the series. And other games that have used a similar combat system to Baldur's Gate these days are considered somehow more dated than Baldur's Gate, even though at the time it was the new hot thing compared to turn-based. So it's it's interesting to see the trends change throughout the years. Yeah. I guess the other thing that distinguishes Baldur's Gate from the the gold box ones is that the gold box ones, they had two different views. Uh, It was actually kind of like playing a a JRPG with random encounters Mm. where you would get a first person view of the area you were in and you would move around tile by tile. Mm -hmm. And then when you encounter the enemies, the whole thing would shift to this like grid based combat system where you can move around. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Whereas Baldur's Gate kept everything on the one, like every, we always used the same interface and the same way you were looking at things that whether you were exploring or in combat or talking to someone, you had the same like, camera position you had the same angle on everything i was looking uh, right before the podcast like this morning at uh, uh footage at let's plays of uh the dark sun games that ssi uh released in the early 90s and that those games were turn-based by the way those kind of looked almost proto Baldur's gate because they have a top-down camera that they keep for both exploration and dialogue um but yeah, it's interesting that you mentioned that because there was a lot of um there were a lot of different perspectives that developers um experimented with with RPGs throughout like the 80s mm. and the early 90s. And uh, uh I feel like they start by the time Baldur's Gate released they were starting to settle on a few different perspectives and a few different subgenres. Yeah. I guess, like, um, one of the reasons, again, that this was so influential is because that engine that they used for it was reused for about half a dozen other other RPGs mm-hmm. by Black Isle. So, like, yeah, it's called the Infinity Engine. And was this the first time it was used? I think it was. Yes, it was. Yeah. So, Baldur's Gate was the first game um, released on the Infinity Engine. And then after it, uh, the technology was licensed to Black Isle that would use it to um, release games like Icewind Dale, Planescape Torment, and Icewind Dale 2. Uh, While um, 
BioWare reused it for uh, Baldur's Gate 2 and its expansion, and then would switch to developing new technology. Uh, I, we're, we've gone off the uh, outline as it uh, was by now. So uh, given we're talking about the Infinity Engine, I would like to mention that the most recent Infinity Engine release was actually nine in uh, sorry 2016, mm. which is really weird thinking about it. But uh, because there have been the enhanced editions of all these Infinity Engine games developed by a little studio called Beamdog, which was founded by some uh, ex Bioware people, um, they eventually got a contract to develop an expansion to Baldur's Gate, a new expansion that sort of bridged the gap between uh, the story of Baldur's Gate and the story of Baldur's Gate 2. And uh, so that was the latest release, like almost 20 years after Baldur's Gate came out. The Infinity Engine also, it was very easy to mod. I remember like when that, when Baldur's Gate came out, I was modding it within like a couple of months. Um, without like any prior experience, because it was apparently just so easy to build tools to change stuff around. So, I remember opening up mm-hmm. and making my own items and characters and stuff, and just they would work fine. And yeah, it's um, again that's why it's been tinkered with for so long because it's apparently just quite easy to to break open and have a look at. Hmm. Mm. Uh, I know. I know that. Uh... Bioware would reuse sort of this mod structure for some of their later games. Uh, the presence, for example, of an override folder inside the game in which you can put files that the game will load instead of the normal install files. Um, and I know that they really focused really hard on modding with uh, Neverwinter Nights. That that was kind of their yeah. attempt to really sell the Dungeons & Dragons experience in full. Yeah. And again, I guess, like, briefly, like, you mentioned uh, Icewind Dale and Planescape Torment as two other Infinity Engine games, which people have probably heard of. And, like, they're kind of very... They're they're sort of two polar opposites in a lot of ways with, like... Icewind Dale is a very straightforward dungeon crawl. It doesn't have much of a story. I think it... Does it even really have a story beyond the intro? It, do, it does it, have yeah. a story. Uh, yeah. It's, it's a very Dungeons & Dragons story at the end of yeah. the day. Uh, but yeah. it does have a narrative through line, and it does have characters and narrative, although it's a, yeah. it's a very linear narrative. Yeah, it's it's um, much closer to, like, a, like, we were talking about, like, Eye of the Beholder or something, where it's just basically a straight dungeon crawl. Mm-hmm. And then uh, well, torment. Planescape Torment. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Oh, just Torment being being the opposite, because that's yeah. that's so character and story driven. Where like, I think you can actually get through it without really fighting anything. Uh, I think there might be a couple of bosses that you have to fight, yeah. but yeah, combat is such a minimal part of Torment. Yeah, which it, is it plays good. a lot. Yeah, yeah, it plays a lot more like an adventure game than a, an RPG. Hmm. Baldur's Gate sort of sat in the middle of those yeah. two polar opposites. Yeah. Cool, thank you. I'm learning a lot today. Yeah. <laughs> well, we have a very interesting question three on this, which is, what's a Balder? <laughs> it was a serious question. So I, I, I took it seriously. Thank you for taking it seriously, Tutu, because you're not a bully like Richie. I, I, I figure, you know, um, some people might look at the title and not immediately understand it, because it's not a very... It doesn't particularly communicate anything about the game to anyone who isn't already interested in Dungeons & Dragons, and... Uh, uh, specifically the Forgotten Realms, which are the Dungeons & Dragons setting that uh, Baldur's Gate is based on. Uh, but to answer the question, so there, there's kind of two answers that I can give to the question, and the first is uh, the, answers, the answer about the fiction of the game. So in the fiction of the game setting, Baldur's Gate is a bustling port city on the Sword Coast, and the city is named after the adventure hero Baldron. Baldron sailed to the continent 
I think it's pronounced Ankorom. And he invested at his return huge sums of money into the village, into his own village, and specifically the construction of a wall and a gate to protect it, which uh, eventually came to be known as the Baldur's Gate, and transitive property led to the city being known as Baldur's Gate. So this is kind of what Baldur in Baldur's Gate stands for. It's uh, basically a shortened version of Baldurin. As for why someone at uh, TSR might have decided to call a city Baldur's Gate, my guess it's that it's a slightly different spelling of the Norse god Baldur. Uh, so I don't know much about Norse mythology, to be completely honest. Uh, so I did a very quick research. And so let me start from the end. I don't think this was like a thematic choice. I don't think this was chosen because it somehow connects to the story of the setting in any meaningful way. I think the person that chose Baldur just thought it sounded cool. <laughs> so I'm going to be honest about that. But as far as I, as far as I understand, Baldur was one of many Norse gods, son of Odin and the goddess Frigg. I don't know if that's the correct pronunciation. Uh, apparently his death was considered one harbinger of Ragnarok, the twilight of the gods, and he also had the greatest ship ever built. Uh, this should all be information contained in the Prose Edda by Snorri Sturluson, but again, I'm not an expert on Norse mythology. Uh, this is all very superficial research, so it's likely that I have missed some nuances or even said something that's not completely correct. So you mentioned greatest ship ever. Is that like a reference to Henrik and Gaskang? <laughs> I didn't know that was a ship. <laughs> it's the greatest ship ever, bro. Okay. Hey, I, I, there's apparently a thriving like MLM community of fan artists and fan fiction for Bloodborne. I had no idea that game could do that, but. All the best to the people involved. What's an MLM? Uh, male love in male. It's basically a, a a way to catch all orientations of uh, men that are interested in men and might not necessarily be gay. They might be uh, bisexual or pansexual or another orientation altogether. Mm-hmm. It can also stand for multi-level marketing and <laughs> Marxist-Leninist Maoist. So make sure it's the right MLM when you're looking up material. <laughs> okay, that's fair. I guess I usually used to think about like MLM as what I just described or WLW as what I just described, but for, but for women because I just like, I, I'm not straight. I hang out with a lot of not straight people. So, you know, that comes up more often than Maoism. Oh, that was so cute. That comes up a lot more often than Maoism. <laughs> and um, I guess, like, going back to Baldur's Gate, like, <laughs> the reason that the game is called Baldur's Gate is that it's the destination. Basically, you spend the game going from the bottom of this coastline to the top of the coastline where Baldur's Gate is, and the story kind of climaxes there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm. Uh, it's it interesting. Climaxes. <laughs> no! Uh, I thought this look, was a safe word. They don't add romance until Baldur's Gate 2, okay? <laughs> okay. Uh... I just wanted to add quickly, given we're talking about the game title now, that uh, this is actually something that they struggled for a while. Choosing yeah. a title for the game. I was looking into articles about uh, um, the development of Baldur's Gate, and uh, apparently there were a bunch of titles that they had uh, um, in the running for Baldur's Gate, including one that was called The Iron Throne. Um, Right. That is, that similarly doesn't say a lot. Uh, and this one is even worse because 
you only understand it if you actually play the game. Otherwise, it's just like three uh, words that m are not actually related to Game of Thrones. Uh, and eventually, um, the one of the producers on the game, Fergus Urquhart, um, who eventually would became would become uh, the CEO of Obsidian, um, who also have a history working on D and D games and uh, oh, Fallout and games as well. Yeah, yeah, um, would just settle on Baldur's Gate. He went like, "Let's go for that," and that's how how the series had its name, and it's a name that works for the original game and none of the other content in the series. Oh. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, because I think, like, by the time you get to, to 2, you've left Baldur's Gate behind, but the yes. series is still called Baldur's Gate. It's a very odd title in retrospect. Yeah. And yeah. it's somehow a, a title that apparently worked better for the console spin-offs, because those have nothing to do, as far as I know, with Baldur's Gate in terms of lore outside of taking place in the same setting, but they do largely take place, as far as I understand, in Baldur's Gate. Mm -hmm. And yeah, you um you can like we talked about Baldaran. You can actually find Baldaran's like gear lying around in Baldur's Gate. Yeah. His like helm and his armor and things, you can acquire those. So mm -hmm. oh. I yeah. think it's supposed to be some kind of interesting revelation. Like, in, it's something that they focus, especially in the expansion to Baldur's Gate. Uh, but I can't say that I ever particularly cared about him as a character because he's so distantly related from the events of the game. Was he even made for the game or is he a Forgotten Realms? Character. I think so. I did some research uh, on the Forgotten Realms uh, fan uh, fandom Wikipedia, um, uh, but sometimes it's hard to find the exact citations to find exactly in what manual things started. But as far right. as I know, Balduran himself existed uh, before the game was developed as a concept. Right. So, do you think it was a situation where, like, they they acquired the Forgotten Realms license, but they weren't allowed to work with anything that was hugely significant? So they sort of stuck with this Baldur's Gate town. Actually, uh, I think it's I uh, I read it's the opposite in some of these articles. Oh, okay. Basically, they went with Baldur's Gate because there was less written about it compared to other locations. Right. Right. Yeah. And they had to ask ask TSR for permission to use book characters, uh, but they did not have to ask for permission for stuff that was in the splat books, in the manuals. So right. they could just go with Baldur's Gate and mostly focus on their own lore and uh, develop a region that was kind of underdeveloped in the original manuals. I guess, like, now that we've you've mentioned, like, splat books and novels and things, we should probably, like, define, I guess, what the deal with this setting is. I guess I should explain what a D&D setting is. <laughs> um, so, basically, Dungeons & Dragons is a kind of a... Um, it's a rule it's, set. It's a rule set. It does have in itself already the seeds of a world, but it's kind of incomplete. Like, there are concepts and ideas that don't necessarily work in every fictional world. Like, it's, there's the fact that it's a, a very medieval fantasy rule set, that there is magic, there are alignments uh, that are not just kind of indications of what your character thinks and how they behave, but they are also uh, related to the state of the cosmos, or, of, 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 the, of the sort of metaphysics of the setting. But there are a lot of ways to handle those elements. And throughout the years, uh, TSR and then Wizards of the Coast, who acquired the D&D license, pretty much as far as I know, during the development of Baldur's Gate, although they were still publishing D&D stuff under the TSR name for a while. Um, they released a, a variety of settings for the D&D rules, and each of these settings kind of had a different twist. So, for example, uh, 
Planescape, we talked about Planescape Torment, it was very focused on the metaphysics of the setting, on the various planes of existence you could travel to, and the factions that occupied uh, these planes and the city at the center of the plane, Sigil. While, for example, Dragonlance had a, was at a series of novels and was much more focused on the struggle between good and evil. Um, uh, there were a series of settings, some of them, like Ravenloft, changed the genre slightly by making D&D more of a gothic horror experience. And in the case of the Forgotten Realms, um, I would say the Forgotten Realms are probably the most popular setting of Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah. And that's probably because I think they embodied D&D at its most basic, the best. Like, uh, mm. Forgotten Realms is just classic fantasy, but there's a lot of it. There's lore in yes. every corner of the world, and there are NPCs at every corner of the world, and localized crises in all these regions, and there's always adventure happening. And there isn't necessarily... Uh, this is going to sound kind of like a diss <laughs> towards the Forgotten <laughs> Realms. I'm sorry. I promise I love the setting, but there isn't necessarily a lot of culture, a lot of a grounded dimension to the setting. But there is a lot of the yeah. um, sword and sorcery that characterizes D&D. &D. Yeah, it's, it's a very, like... Um... Like the 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 sort of like you were saying when you picture D and D, you probably picture the Forgotten Realms, the sort of like very Tolkien inflected, but also like very high fantasy, with wizards and warriors running around, sort of mm -hmm. situation. Yeah. yeah, it's basically if I had to describe D and D at least as it started, it would be Tolkien meets Conan, uh, Tolkien meets the Pulps, basically. Um, yeah, Gary Gygax didn't really like Tolkien all that much, but he was smart enough to know that people really, really love those books, and he should probably just pillage them as much as he could. Yeah, and, and Forgotten Realms is... Um, it wasn't Gygax, who was... Uh, was it Greenwood? Uh, yeah, Forgotten Realms, yeah. I should say. Technically, it, was, it didn't even start as a D&D setting, which is something I learned relatively recently. Not specifically while I was researching for the podcast, but uh, uh, it was basically a fantasy setting that Greenwood was developing. Even the name Forgotten Realms, it means jack shit now, uh, but <laughs> it was, it made sense when he started developing the setting because the idea was, uh, are you familiar with the concept of portal fantasy? I think you should explain it for everyone's benefit. Mm. Okay, so. <laughs> Basically, portal fantasy is sort of a subgenre of fantasy. Um, think Narnia. There's people from our world that reach another one and have an adventure there. And the Forgotten Realms were kind of devised as a world that was connected to ours via a series of portals. Uh, but eventually, these portals were disappearing, and that's why the realms were, for were forgotten. Uh, this concept completely disappeared, uh, I think, pretty early on. The name stuck. Yeah, it's the first I've heard of it. Um, and yeah, uh, it, it was just, I don't remember exactly the specifics, but TSR was interested in using the setting for D&D, uh, struck a deal with Greenwood. And technically, I think to this day, Greenwood has the final say as to whether something goes in the Forgotten Realms or not. Uh, Again, I would need to be completely sure. Um, so take this with a grain of salt, but it still has a heavy deal of involvement with the setting. Mm -hmm. hmm. And um, by splat book, which is a term people might not know, a splat book is basically it's a term you use to describe a supplement for D and D, yeah, or any other. RPG system. It's like this is not mandatory to play it, but here is basically a splat, a bunch of stuff you can use. 
yeah. they've released a number of Forgotten Realms splite books that would say, okay, like here's like all the details on this this area, or like here's the complete here's like a book that is just about like druids or something like that that you can use the information for. Baldur's Gate was released kind of on the tail end of the uh AD and D second edition rule set, and it had kind of become unwieldy with splat books at that point. There were yeah. A lot of supplements, some of them better received than others. Um, as part, this is just a funny tidbit, but as part of the um, Kickstarter campaign for uh, a Planescape Torment successor, Torment Tides of Numenera, Colin McComb, who had worked on the video game Torment and also as a writer for some of these plot books, have had to had to. Uh, do a video apology for writing the complete book of elves. <laughs> I, 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 I think I, I still love that he did that. Uh, the apology, not the actual book. Ooh, shade. <laughs> and um, yeah, I guess if people are interested in what D and D looks like when they don't license a setting, that's the 1999 D and D movie. Wait. Wait, are you throwing shade at that movie? I think everyone's throwing shade at that movie. I love that movie! Yeah, I, I also adore it, but it's not good. What? It's good! It's excellent! I saw it multiple times when it came out. I even saw it in the theater. Yeah, so did I, and I have, I have two copies of it on DVD. Sometimes I don't know about you, Richie. I, w- I will give the original uh, Dungeons and Dragons movie props for not being any of its mm. sequels. Yeah. Uh, there were sequels? There were sequels, yes. I watched the second one, which was kind of a direct yeah. sequel, but also they tweaked the settings, but not really. And uh, so I have to set the mood for how it happened. I had just come home from a New Year's Eve party, um, and I had gotten no sleep that night. So I was in a state where I hadn't actually drunk all that much, but I was kind of in a groggy mindset. So because I couldn't fall asleep, I was just changing the channels on my TV until I landed on that movie. And on one hand, I have to admire that they tried, like they genuinely tried with that movie to actually have the at least basic details of D&D be part of the plot. But it was so bad in that cheap direct-to-video and it's also earnest way that I don't think I could have watched it in any other situation except for as a sleep aid. I also own it on DVD. <laughs> oh my god! And my copy is in tight because I couldn't find it in any other regions. <laughs> That's amazing. What? It's like a cursed item. <laughs> okay, no, this this is like how far back my tendrils stretch. There's a close-up of Jeremy Irons with his, like, eyes massively wide doing this bizarre face that you will see if you, like, Google the D&D movie. Um, about half of those are copies of, like, when I uploaded it in, like, 2001 to, like, a forum. And then, like, people just saved that, that exact screenshot. <laughs> <laughs> oh... Okay, so um, back to something D&D related that is actually good, like Baldur's Gate. Um, uh, So we've talked a little bit about um, uh, Baldur's Gate setting and a a, a little bit about the mechanic. Do you want me to elaborate about the mechanics? Um, I I I think we should go into the mechanics because, like, if you don't know anything about D anD D, which like a lot of people didn't when they first played it, it is a real like head scratcher initially. That it just starts it without any kind of attempt to lull you into it. Starts throwing around terms like Thaco, and 
things like that. And like your, it doesn't tell you that your armor level going down is better than it going up and things like that. It's what? sort of weird. Yeah. 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 Yes. In, in uh, second edition D and D, the lower your armor, the better it is. I will say in Baldur's Gate defense, this game was published back when they still expected players to start to read the manuals yeah. before they started the game, uh, while the game was installing. Uh, so um, they, these concepts are... Ma- Baldur's Gate has a pretty thick manual, and all of these concepts of, of the rules of the game are explained yeah. in the manual, but the game kind of... Uh, it does have a tutorial, but it's more of an interface mm. tutorial than a tutorial on the rule sets. Like, it, it does have a, all of those little fetch quests at the start of the game to familiarize you with how to play the game. Um, but because of the difficulty curve of D&D, you can also die during the tutorial. Yeah. yeah, that's another thing that I guess people might not that's the thing that would throw you, particularly if you'd played, like, JRPGs prior to this, is that your character might start out with, like, four hit points and die in one hit. Yes. D&D is a Souls-like? <laughs> um... <laughs> I guess, well, not really, because it's all probability-based. So it's not like you can get through it by dodging at the right time. It's just, like... Oh, a rat bit me, I'm dead. <laughs> this is something that has persisted throughout the editions, with the exception of the fourth edition, I think, where they changed the rules for DHP you have when you start. I think there was a comparison someone did in third edition where starting uh, wizards could be killed by house cats, as the rules were written. Yep. Well... You might hear people talk about RPGs being small numbers versus big numbers. And because D&D, like, it had to be played with dice and paper, the numbers it uses are very small. So you're not, even, you're not having to keep track of, like, three-digit hit point totals like you would be in a Dark Souls game, because that's all handled by a computer. So in D&D, yeah, like, you, um, you have to roll a dice when you make your character to determine how many hit points they have. And um, it's possible that you will get one. Uh. You have that one hit point, so just by definition, any damage at all, because it's going to inflict at least one hit point of damage, you die. So it can be a cat. <laughs> so is that what Corvo tried to do to me when he almost ripped my eye out? Well, that's because D and D is like when when they built the foundations of it. It's meant for like adventuring in a labyrinth with monsters. So the baseline for it is like the baseline of a monster you would encounter in a labyrinth, but you kind of can't go below it because it's the baseline. So cats end up doing quite a lot of damage relative to everything else because otherwise they would do zero. Mm. Yeah, D and D is a kind of a fascinating mm. history because how it started was not yeah. how it was played already by the time uh, Baldur's Gate was released. So I guess to talk about the mechanics first, I should maybe do kind of a high-level uh, talk, uh, just to ex- ex- establish a couple of things. So uh, Baldur's Gate is based on the AD&D 2nd edition rule set. This is not actually the 2nd edition of Dungeons & Dragons, by the way, because fuck it. We shouldn't make it so simple. <laughs> D&D at the time had two product lines. One was basic Dungeons & Dragons, which was supposed to be more introductory for players that were maybe a little younger and didn't want as many rules. And that some people considered the better iteration of the rule set at the time. And the other was Advanced Dungeons & Dragons, which uh, first was released, of course, as Advanced Dungeons & Dragons and then re- received a revision of the rule set, which is what uh, Baldur's Gate was based on. And in Baldur's Gate, you create one character, uh, but you're supposed to control, uh, in most circumstances, six characters. So the other five slots that you have in your party will eventually be filled by either other players, if you're playing in multiplayer, or 
companions that you recruit throughout the game. And as Richard man- mentioned earlier, um, you kind of control the game through a, an RTS sort of interface. It's played in real time, but the underlying rules are still turn-based. We have a few changes made to some mechanics uh, to um, accommodate the fact that you're playing in real time. And so, for example, party members and enemies won't ne- necessarily act in order of initiative and stuff like that. Um, but one thing that Baldur's Gate has is the pause. So you can set a series of the basics of pauses that you press your space bar or the button on the UI with your mouse and the game freezes. But unlike pause in other games, you can still give orders uh, during this pause. So it's kind of meant to bridge the gap. Uh, to have a rule set as complicated as Dungeons & Dragons in full real time would have probably been too much. So you can pause the game at any time I sort of consider the situation and decide what to do, uh, which is very, very helpful. I cannot imagine playing any of these games without the pause. Um, and you can also uh, you can also select uh, a series of check marks from the options to make the game auto pause in many situations. Uh, so essentially, there are, I would say, three core mechanics to Baldur's Gate to simplify. One is combat, of course. It's got uh, a, a rather faithful rendition of the anti combat with a lot of rules and spells implemented. Even spells that the developers went on and admitted this doesn't really necessarily work in the game, but we wanted a full D&D experience, so we put it in anyway. Um, there's dialogue, and dialogue is done through a dialogue tree, which um, uh, resembles very closely, for example, the way dialogue worked in Fallout just a year before. Um, I like dialogue in RPGs of this era because they did a lot of experiments, but this is sort of, at the end of the 90s, it was starting to converge all on dialogue trees and menus from which you selected a response to what uh, uh, the other uh, NPC said. And then there's exploration. And because this is a game that takes place from an isometric perspective, exploration is essentially point and clicking. You point your party towards a place and they use their AI pathfinding to reach that place. And uh, I have to say, at release, Baldur's Gate did not have the best pathfinding, which mixed with the fact that uh, Bioware still was learning how to design levels for uh, this kind of... uh, uh, this kind of gameplay uh, made for a lot of annoying situations. Like, can you give an example of what you mean? Um, there's a famous dungeon in Baldur's Gate that's called Firewine Ruins. Um, let me just check for a second if the name is correct. Yes, okay. Firewine Ruins is basically a labyrinth filled with traps where every corridor is like just wide enough for a single person to pass through. And when the AI doesn't have uh, the space to pass, it will start to try to find another way to get to the same place. Uh And often this means that even though you painstakingly made them avoid, for example, a trap, they will go back go uh, back to the trap you avoided or in uncharted territory trigger traps which in these dungeons through lightning bolts that bounced off the walls and uh, potentially kill your whole party simply because the AI couldn't wait for your party member to reach their destination. Huh. Well, sounds like a game for experts. <laughs> And and yeah, like you combine that with like we were saying in the old D and D rules, characters couldn't take much damage, especially if they're not a frontline fighting character. So you ended up in situations where like you order your party of six to go from A to B, 
they will get stuck in something on the way and then the wizard at the back will just decide to take this incredibly circuitous route and probably just walk through like a bunch of monsters that will kill them. And um, yeah, when you die in this game... When you die in this game, you die in real life? Yep. You, you, die, you die way too easily in this game for that to happen. But <laughs> there are resurrection mechanics because this follows uh, the AD&D rule set. Um, so how it happens is if, a, there are two ways a character can die, uh, and I don't remember the exact mechanics of it, but basically characters that die normally have their portrait grayed out. They leave all of their loot and equipment on the floor mm-hmm. and you can like go to a temple. I don't think in Baldur's Gate 1 you, you have access to a resurrection spell yourself. So you have to go back to a temple and resurrect them. And in the meantime, you have to drag all of the loot back with you. Um, if, however, a character takes, I think, too much damage while dying, uh, there is a gib effect. Uh, basically, you see a lot of gore. The character sort of explodes in a shower of gore. And their what? portrait just disappears, and you cannot resurrect them anymore. Oh, wow. There's also some spells that will do that. There's like disintegration spells that just remove the character entirely yes. and they're just gone. I think those spells were... Yeah. Sorry. And um, Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say like the the other part to this that makes it extremely frustrating is that this only applies to the NPCs that you recruit. If your character dies, it's an instant game over. Yes. 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 So if you started the game as a wizard with three hit points, you're going to be gaming over a lot because every time you trigger a trap, every time a wayward arrow finds you, you know, a single goblin gets lucky, you just die and it's game over and you have to reload. Yeah. Yeah, there is kind of a story reason for that, but it's a very frustrating mechanic to deal with. Yes. Uh, especially at the start of Baldur's Gate. Uh, it becomes less of an issue as the, as the game, as the, as the series goes on. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, we kind of touched on uh, an aspect, for example, of the D&D rules that is less common in RPGs these days, there, there are a lot of effects that just outright kill your character or incapacitate them to a point where they are essentially dead. Yeah, petrification <laughs> is a big one in Baldur's Gate. You're like, if your party runs into a basilisk... Yes. Like, if you don't have that potion of mirror eyes with you, you're just basically all dead, because you're all going to be petrified. Mm-hmm. Mm. And I think because a lot of people that listen to the Snack Covenant, I assume, are familiar with similar effects in Dark Souls, uh, the big difference, I would say, is that in Dark Souls, it's a build-up. Uh, like, for example, the um, curse of the basilisks in the depths. Uh, they, they throw that smoke at you, and you have to stay in that, in that area of effect for a while for it to build up until you get petrified and cursed. While in Baldur's Gate, it's based on a roll of the dice. Um, there, are d- there are these um, rolls that are listed in your character sheet called saving throws, and those determine um, how easily you will be able to resist these effects. And you start with those... Um, so... Um, I was gonna, let's say pretty low, even though technically the numbers are pretty high, because the numbers are what you have to roll against. And uh, so when you, when you meet monsters like that and you're at a low level, it's very, very easy to get petrified or killed in a n- number of other ways. Mm-hmm. Mm. Especially given the, um, the structure of the game early on is your character is after the tutorial area dropped into the middle of a wooded space on their own. Yes. And uh, if you walk off the path, there's monsters that, if you don't have the hit points for it, can just one-shot you. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. And you're ex- yeah, you're extremely vulnerable and you you they do give you party members pretty quickly, but they can also die very very easily. Yes. So, yes. What I think they expect you to do is to mostly follow the road. Mm. Um, but obviously you're also tempted to explore and there are a lot of enemies that will just completely destroy a lot of starting characters, especially because, uh, um, like it's perfectly possible. The game doesn't stop you from building a character that isn't really equipped to complete the game. Now, there are a lot of ways to mitigate that, um, both after you've created the characters, thanks to magic items, and uh, before creating the character, by simply, you know, uh, informing yourself on the mechanics of the game. But uh, this was very much an old-school role-playing game where um, there was faithful to the D&D rules, where the idea that kind of um, balance should be about the viability of characters was really not uh, something that existed. Yeah. It's about the synergy between the different classes. So, like, we mentioned Fallout before, which was another Black Isle thing. And, like, in Fallout, you sort of... You kind of want to build a balanced character who can do a bunch of different things because you're going to be doing this on your own. Whereas in D&D, at least in Baldur's Gate, it kind of helps to like, okay, I'm going to build a wizard, so I'm just going to put everything into their ability to cast spells and nothing Mm -hmm. else. Like, I'm going to lower all my stats and just dump that into intelligence. Because I don't have to worry about, like, physical combat, because someone else will do that. I don't have to worry about, like, healing, because someone else will Mm -hmm. do that. I think one thing that's interesting about Baldur's Gate and the Infinity Engine games is that they even though it wasn't necessarily intentional, they kind of fixed the problem with AD&D, second edition at least, uh, which was the, the fact that the abilities, the active abilities between the various, characters, cl- the various character classes were very, very unevenly distributed. Uh, like the caster classes, they had a ton of spells, a ton of things to do. Um, governed by uh, a very archaic system, the Vancian magic system, where they had to memorize the spells for each day uh, and choose exactly what yeah. loadout they wanted. But they had a lot of options. Where fighters, with a fighter in Baldur's Gate, you basically point them to a person and attack, or maybe drink a potion. That's all you do. At least until you get to uh, the front of Bal expansion to Baldur's Gate 2, which starts giving out high-level abilities because you've kind of reached an epic level um, of expertise. Uh, But because Baldur's Gate is a game that puts you, at least in single player, in control of a whole party, that's not really a problem. Like, it's kind of a benefit to the game that you don't have to spend the same amount of time on all the characters, because there are six of them. And if you had the same amount of active abilities, it would be a lot harder to handle. You would have to make so many decisions that it would kind of become a little hard to handle for a game that wants to be at least nominally in real time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm. I think I completely missed, by the way, I apologize for that. I moved the discussion away so we never actually defined concepts like Thaco and Armor class. Do do you want to do a really quick primer on that, then? Because it's such an archaic and weird system. Yeah, I I guess, like, the issue isn't so much what we're describing as the fact that this PC game that got a mainstream release just throws these terms at you immediately and doesn't really explain them unless you read the manual. So, like we were saying before, old D&D, your armor class, which was your armor, It didn't govern your defense, it governed how hard you were to hit. And that was added to the role that your opponent made to hit you. So if you had a high armor class, that added to the role. So if my armor class was five, I'm actually giving my opponent an extra like five points when they roll to hit me. So you actually want your armor class to be low. You want it to be like 
Yeah, somewhere in the negatives, preferably. Basically, how I would explain it is that it is actually very simple arithmetics. It's not complex, yeah, but it is explained uh, even as far as the basic rule set is. It's presented in the most archaic way possible. Like even just the abbreviation Thaco kind of yeah. conjures the idea of a mathematical equation. It really just means yeah. to eat to eat armor class zero. So that's the basic. You have to yeah. roll at least this number to hit armor class zero. And if an enemy has armor class above zero, then you can lower the number by that armor class. And if they have uh, armor class under zero, then you add that to the roll. So it's not a complicated concept, but... Um, it's counterintuitive. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, because I, I rem- like one of the things with, um, again, with second edition AD&D is it starts doing things like there are some things you want to roll high for, there's some things you want to roll low for, there's some things where you want to roll, you have to roll a percentile dice, there's some things where you have to roll a four-sided dice. And I remember when, because as you were saying, this was the tail end of AD&D second edition as they were moving into third. Um, the, mm-hmm. when they were designing third, one of the things they said is we just want to make this as simple as possible. So you always want to roll as high as possible. Big numbers always mean you're better at something and everything uses a 20 sided dice. Yeah. Cause prior to that, it was like pile. Yeah. Just these piles and piles and piles of differently shaped dice and constantly having to refer to like, okay, I have to roll. 2d10 but then it has to be under this number but then there's this skill where i have to roll over the number but it's on a d8 etc like that basically ad and d second edition even though it was a revision it kind of is the result of dungeons and dragons editorial history up to that point being a lot of rules that were added to a very narrow basic set of rules even though some were changed and even thaco which was was meant to be a simplification in the D and D second edition because before Thacker they used it matrices, uh, which basically you had to compare your role to all of these numbers to see whether mm. you were hitting or not. Um, but eventually, with D and D third edition, they started a process where uh, they wanted to simplify at least the basic rules because third edition is very complex in many other ways. Mm. Um, but at least the basics of like how you roll to attack, uh, or whether you have how you roll to resist a spell, they are all very consistent across the board. So it's easier to learn. And I guess I guess another um, influence of that on Baldur's Gate is the thief class, which levels up completely differently to every other class in that. Instead of just gaining a bonus when you level up, you have to distribute percentile points among four different thief skills, which, like, no other class does that, but in this case it yes. does. Yes. It's, uh, it's very strange because yeah. um, Baldur's Gate doesn't really have, like, if you think about similar comparable RPGs, many of them tend to have, like, a core of combat abilities and then a skill system on top of on top of that that is class agnostic, like that's for example how Neverwinter Nights works. But uh, in Adian, in Baldur's Gate, um, uh, you have your class abilities, uh, weapon specializations where you put some points into weapon categories to become better at them, which are also not very intuitive because actually not having a weapon specialization gives you a a penalty. And then you have the thief abilities, which, unlike everything else in the game, work on percentiles and for a lot of reasons are not super easy to wrap your head around. Hmm. And another example, like that, is also sort of weirdly counterintuitive unless you understand D and D classes, is that like I can give my wizard the maximum possible strength, and they will still probably do less damage punching things than a fighter who has like the baseline strength for a fighter, because the game is isn't looking necessarily at the strength; it's looking at the class to determine a lot of things. So strength is another um, thing where 
what I mentioned before, rules were kind of added throughout the years, rears its ugly head. Because you might see in a lot of Baldur's Gate character sheets, um, a character that has a strength of 18 slash something. And that is because when a character rolled 18 for strength, and yes, in Baldur's Gate, just like in D&D, you roll for your character attributes, although you can re-roll as many times as you want, so that's not really a problem. It's just a cool artifact of the fact that it's a D&D game. Mm. When you roll 18 strength, you then have to roll a percentile dice uh, to decide where in the in in this apparent spectrum of 18 strength people you sit. Yeah. And a lot of the strength bonuses are determined by that dice roll, which is really strange. I know that this all sounds like a takedown of Baldur's Gate, but they were really just being faithful to how AD&D 2nd edition rules were. Yeah. And I think they did a very good job at uh, using them, especially for a first effort. So, Yeah, because it's a massively complex thing to try implementing, but they actually did it. Yeah. And there's a lot of, like, interesting loopholes that it creates. Like, like we were talking about percentile strength, and, like, Another percentile system the game uses is the percentage to force a locked thing open with your brute strength. So, like, I would often sit there and re-roll until I was able to get 1800 strength. And then I could just wander around the tutorial area breaking into everything. Because <laughs> you, couldn't, you, you couldn't pick the locks with a, a thief at that point because your th- lock picking wouldn't be high enough. But... The strength is just a raw thing about the character. The game isn't comparing your level or anything. So I could just wander around smashing open all these chests and taking all of this stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I never tried. Yeah. I have to be honest. I never tried doing that. If I if I replay Baldur's Gate with a fighter, I should probably give it a try. Especially because it's not all that difficult. Because you can reroll your attributes as much as you want to eventually get mm. uh, the maximum strength score. At the start, because yeah. then you can raise strength to 19 and 20. Yeah, it's it's very odd because the game goes to all of this trouble to differentiate different kinds of having 18 strength, but then it also just goes to 19. <laughs> <laughs> I guess we should clarify that the reason it's 18 is that your stats are determined by you rolling three six-sided yes. dice together. Yeah, yeah, so 18 is the maximum roll, yeah. Um. So... I believe that um, that was because um, back when D&D had just started, when it was just the free booklets, what's sometimes colloquially called Zeroth Edition, um, mm. it already started getting supplements, mostly written by Gygax, and he eventually made efforts to make the fighters feel more useful, to make high strength feel more useful. Um, yeah. And that's why... Uh, I don't know, honestly, why he decided to go with a percentile dice. I think it was because um, he didn't want to give the possibility. Like, he could have just, if you rolled 18, you roll a d6 another time or something like that. But he went with a percentile yeah. dice. It just, he really liked that dice. <laughs> I guess was a weirdo. <laughs> he was. The thing that I want to make clear, though, is that, as you said, there are a lot of loopholes and there is um, a lot of death as a result of having such an arcane rule set implemented to such detail. Um, Even though there is a very high barrier of entry, you can do a lot of interesting things, um, especially because Baldur's Gate is filled to the brim with magic items and consumables that are very, very powerful. Um, so there are a lot of ways to, uh, navigate the encounters throughout the game. Um, this is how I did a, a solo run was basically just abusing all of those loopholes. Fully. I mean, uh, one of the most famous strategies to beat the final fight is just to spam uh, the wand of summoning monsters. Yep. You basically just come up with a lot of monsters to attack the final boss, and it never really even deals with oh. you. Yeah, and there's a, I, that's actually the strategy I used for a lot of it, because often there would be a situation where a fight was going to trigger with a character. But 
because the character wasn't hostile yet, you could you could just summon monsters and they wouldn't care. Mm-hmm. So you could like I remember that specifically toward the end there's a fight with a wizard in a quite large room. Mm-hmm. And I just filled every single square of the room with summoned monsters <laughs> yeah. before I talked to him. Cause and he just didn't pay attention or notice. And then as soon as the fight started, he just got slaughtered and stunlocked. <laughs> Because he had no no means of <laughs> countering any of it. Actually, in um God, in Baldur's Gate 2, they add like the the D D sort of pantheon of demons. And there's a demon called Demogorgon. Yes. Who's like the the strongest, like not the I don't think it's actually the strongest, but like one of the strongest demons in the D D pantheon. Yeah. And um I was able to solo that because he has a it's like a 95% resistance to paralysis, but not 100. Mm-hmm. So I, was, I just sent this conga line of things that had an innate paralysis attack to him. And eventually one of them got lucky and paralyzed him. And then that's how I killed the king of the demons. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just, just spamming something until he failed a saving throw. Um, it's sort something that is not... Um... I guess because now we're talking about both games, something that I think is interesting mm. about how they evolve mechanically uh, throughout the series is that in Baldur's Gate, uh, there isn't yet um, as much of a reliance on these resistances and this idea of having to go through the resistances and the spell protections of an enemy mage, for example. It's uh, Mm. A little more pared back. It's already there, kind of. Yeah. Well, I, I, I guess, like, if we want to talk about, like, the, the character power level, is that Baldur's Gate limits you to, I think, the level cap is seven. Which yeah. Which is reasonably powerful. Mm. Technically, I guess, if we want to talk about level caps, we, we should quickly mention that the D&D rules at this point hadn't uh, normalized levels across classes and across mm, races. Yeah. So thieves, for example, advanced faster, required less XP to advance to another level than other classes like the wizard, or I guess as it was called in AD and D second edition, the mage. Um, mm. So I think the level cap, to be precise, isn't really a level cap as much as an experience. It's cap. an ex- it's an XP cap, yeah. So, like, a level in AD&D is pretty significant. It's a pretty... Sig- like, jumping from level 1 to level 2 is... It's a big deal in terms of character power. So, when we say that you're, like, you're capped at... You have an XP cap, but it's around, like, level 7 to level 8, depending on your class. Um, going from level 1 to level 7 or 8 is, like, it's a pretty big jump. Like, that is the whole game. You are... By the end of it, you know, you you will peak at that level. It's not, like, a weird arbitrary sort of cap thing but um when you start Baldur's Gate 2 because it's meant to be a direct continuation your characters start at that level and then keep getting stronger Mm -hmm. so that's when you start running into like these extremely complicated wizard duels where the wizards will have as you were saying all these different layers of protections and like shields and things that you have to know the kind of counter to to be able to go through them yeah, to be completely honest, yeah. to this day, I still don't remember all those spells, so I just have a cheat sheet saved on my phone and on my browser to be sure that I know what to well, do. Well, I, I, have, I have the ultimate cheat. What is it? You close the door, because <laughs> the AI doesn't open doors. <laughs> so you, you start the fight with the wizard, you close the door. And then you just, like, have the party rest for eight hours, come back. All the protections have been dispelled because they don't last for eight hours. And then you can just kill them. I am not 100% sure some of these exploits still work in the, yeah, they in the announced editions <laughs> of the games. I think some of this stuff was patched out. Um, but yeah, there, there were a lot of exploits in, in these games. Yeah, uh, Like, you could beat the final boss of... Uh, uh, Baldur's Gate 2, uh, by if you knew ahead of time the position it would spawn in, you would just place your thief, plant traps there until you were sure they mm. would do enough damage to kill him. And then you would just like trigger the final cats in, it would have his big speech, and then it would explode because all of those traps would do 
so much damage the instant combat started. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the um, uh, thieves, thieves could lay traps, but the game didn't care. Like, the traps didn't take up any physical space. So what you could do is you could lay a trap and then... Like that they had it was like a an eight hour cooldown, I think. So you'd lay a trap, rest, lay another trap, rest. Just do that for a couple of days. Until you've stacked like a dozen traps in the one spot. And then whatever walks there next, the because the game isn't keeping track of like space, they'll just all trigger yeah, at once. Yeah. And you can kill you can kill dragons that way. Like your your little like yeah, your little thief character becomes like the strongest thing in the game provided. Yeah you know when you can trigger an encounter. It's, it's just a comic amount of bear traps all closing together on the toe of a dragon. <laughs> <laughs> also, like, playing Baldur's Gate, I soloing it, I discovered kind of interesting interactions that weren't really loopholes, mm. but I would never have thought to do them before. Mm. Like, um, a good example is the Grease spell. Which is a spell that, when yeah. you cast it, it basically just makes a gigantic pool of grease. And we're talking, like, base-level D&D mage that gets, like, one or two spells total at that point. It seems ridiculous that you would waste it on grease. But, weirdly, the grease spell became massively useful for me because I could, if I saw a party of, like, goblins or orcs or whatever, I could throw grease at them. They would all slip over, and then yeah. I could just stand outside the grease throwing rocks at them. And they didn't do very much damage, but they, they wouldn't be able to get me because they kept slipping over when they stood up. And sudden, and things like using the charm spell. You can use the charm spell both um, in yeah. combat. You can also, I don't remember exactly if you can, uh, to what extent you can use it in combat. I remember that the implementation in Baldur's Gate is a little... Um, they kind of made it more powerful than it would be in an actual D&D session because the D&D rules usually mm. uh, say something like this person cannot do something that would go against their own self-preservation or something they believe strongly, um, which is uh, something that you can actually do in Baldur's Gate. You just take full control of the character, basically. Yeah, yeah. Another really interesting aspect of charm that they worked in that I didn't know about for years is that if you charm enemies, you can sometimes talk to them and they will have unique dialogue for you, like revealing things about the story that you don't find out. Like, mm -hmm. yeah. There are a lot of character details that I didn't know until I stumbled on a compilation of these charm dialogues on YouTube. Like complete bits of background about a character that you will never learn unless you have the idea to charm them to have this kind of conversation, which is one of the great aspects of some of these older RPGs. Uh, in some other aspects, the options for quest resolutions in Baldur's Gate are quite limited. This is still very much a game that focuses mostly on combat. But on the other hand, you have all these little hidden details and the possibility to exploit uh, this breadth of spells and abilities that D&D gives to you um, uh, that is quite fascinating and not, um, how can I put it, it's not signposted in the same way that it would be in a modern RPG, where usually the options to the quest are very obviously defined to you by a quest giver at the start of the quest. Yeah. Uh, like, I love Fallout New Vegas, but in Fallout New Vegas, when you have a big quest with a lot of options, usually the person who is giving it to you is going to tell you something like, hmm, you could try sneaking into the room. <laughs> or I heard that this person has a heart condition. Maybe you can do something about that. And then you get all of the quest markers uh, to do those things. Baldur's Gate just kind of wants you to find those details yourself. And maybe there aren't as many ways to resolve the quest or the encounter. Uh, but when you discover something that is very well hidden, like those charm dialogues, it's much more rewarding. Mm. It's a difference in philosophy because, of course, like we were both talking about the fact we never found that until much later. Um, so it's a question also of how much it works, but I think when it does, it's, it's, a, it's an incredibly rewarding thing to find one of these details. Yeah. 
Oh, actually, do you want to talk about the the oddness of like D and D class and how it intersects with race? Because that's one of the Richie introduced the topic, so I can edit it in. Thank you. Yes. Okay, so I guess we should talk about how class and Richie, a little more enthusiasm. You sound so unsure of yourself. What you never played D and D before? Are you are you trying to provoke me? No comment. I'm trying to provoke enthusiasm from you. Let's talk about how class and race work in D&D. <laughs> I'm enthusiastic. <laughs> <laughs> Be honest with me. You're not going to edit the part when you're actually provoking him. You're going to leave it in. It depends on what my muse tells me. <laughs> okay, so... D&D since the beginning has had like an odd relationship with like what race in terms of like human dwarf elf etc can do what thing it was kind of restrictive and a lot of it was sort of kind of bolted on after the fact to try and recreate sort of fantasy archetypes that people wanted so the idea of like a a multi class yes. character the idea that a character could have aspects of, like, I think the one they were looking at was a mage and a thief at the same time. That's because the uh, there were um, fantasy mm -hmm. novels where there was, like, the idea of a trickster sort of wizard character, but that couldn't be modelled in the system they had, so they had to come up with this concept called multi-classing. Yes, and they kind of evolved it also based on player feedback throughout the years. Like yeah. Many of the races, I think, start as essentially as character classes. Like the character that you were playing was either a fighter or like yeah, the elf. The is elf. It, yeah. And the elf was already kind of a, a defined archetype to, uh, to Gygax and mm. to the people who were working at the Indy at the time. By the way, I want to kind of make a, just, just a very quick aside. When I mention Gygax, it's not because I think Dave Arnson. Uh, didn't have any influence on D&D, quite the contrary, but like his influence also stops quite early compared to Gygax, who kept working at TSR yeah. for a very long time. And it was very hands-on, so this is why I mention yeah. Gygax more often. And so like certain, certain uh, characters can have more than one class. And that works differently depending on if you are a human or not, because they actually use totally different systems. Again, this is like systems upon systems upon systems that all interact in strange ways. So, yes, yeah. I have to be honest, and I have to say that I never understood why it was done that way. Yeah. It's like they wanted to play test two different multi-class systems and just yeah. put both of them in. It's very bizarre. If you're what's called a demi-human which is, like, not a human, like an elf or a dwarf or something. You can be two classes at once, but the two classes, and sometimes three, actually, classes at once. I think Fighter Mage Thief is something you can also do. I think Fighter Mage Cleric is also doable. Um, you can do those, but that depends on the race you are. So, like, a like I think only a, if you're a half-elf, you can be a, a thief mage, but the mage part has to be Enchanter or something like that. And like, if you're a gnome, you 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 can be you have to be an illusionist. You can't be another kind of mage if you're multi class. Yes, yeah, it's full of things like that, um, that are meant to evoke certain fantasy archetypes, and um, then the humans are handled. And if if you're a multi class character, the way it works is just that you're two classes at once, and the experience you gets divided between the two of them. So you get half as much experience mm -hmm. per class, they're leveling up separately, but you will gain the benefits of both as they level up. Yeah. Um, then you have humans who have a completely bizarre system called dual classing, where you, you can't multi-class, you have to pick a class. You start as that class, but then at any point you can dual class. And when you dual class, you reset to level one as a new class. So you lose, I think, everything other than your hit points is reset yeah, to base it's... levels. And then you start leveling again. 
But then when the new class you've got is higher than the level of your original class, you then get both. Yeah. yeah. It's, a, it's a very, very strange system uh, that is quite counterintuitive. Uh, you really have to kind of uh, um, plan when you want to make this switch, yeah. because if you make it too late, you're making things very, very mm. hard yeah. for yourself. A, a good like example of of when why dual classing is sort of useful is like if you just start as a fighter and then immediately if you want to make a mage if you start as a fighter and then immediately dual class to a mage you when that mage hits level two they will have like the base like fighting skill of a level one fighter which is you know enough to get them by in a lot of circumstances. They'll also mm -hmm. be able to, yeah. like, use shields and use helmets and things that a mage can't usually do. Another one would be if you start off as a thief, you maybe build up, like, 100% stealth or 100% pickpocket or 100% lockpick and then dual class to something else. Then you'll be able to keep those abilities. Mm -hmm. mm. So it's. I want to mm. point out... Yeah, sorry. Oh, just it, no, it, it is kind of flexible in a, a weird way. It's just that they can't just it's they're doing both of them at once. It's just very odd. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I wanted to quickly point out because you mentioned the thief. If someone is playing Baldur's Gate like in 2019 or 2020, depending on when uh, they're listening to this podcast and when it comes out, they are probably playing the enhanced edition of Baldur's Gate. So they might be wondering there's a part of the character system that you haven't talked about yet, which is kits. Oh, Why yeah. aren't you talking about that? And the reason is it actually wasn't a part of Baldur's Gate originally. Mm. Uh, when Baldur's Gate came out, it was just the base classes with, I think, the exception of the mages who had their yeah. own specializations. Um, but when Baldur's Gate 2 came out, an addition that they made to the system was when you selected a class, you could also select uh, from a variety of kits. And kits are basically subclasses. They change some aspect of how a class works. And I mention this in relation to Thief, because part of the common wisdom of Infinity Engine players is, does, is that a single class kitless Thief is basically useless. You should never, under any circumstance, make a character like that. Um, because the kits are just much better than the base class is. So that mm. was something that I wanted to mention, because it might seem strange that we weren't talking about that, but it actually wasn't part yeah, of the Infinity yeah. Engine at the start. And they, they did have the kits in Baldur's Gate 2. And, um... yeah. There's another like interesting use of dual classing there because one of the fighter kits is a fighter that doesn't wear armor. And one of the big things in D&D &D is if you're a wizard, you don't get to wear armor because it apparently interferes with your ability to cast spells. So if you take this fighter that specializes in not using armor and then you dual class to a mage, it kind of doesn't affect you because you weren't going to be able yeah. to wear armor anyway. So you can come up with like really interesting combinations, but only because the system is so archaic and strange. Yeah, yeah. there is a lot of flexibility, but it's not necessarily communicated in the best way to players. Yeah. Um, I would say that it's uh, even though there are a lot of ways you can navigate all of these mechanics... Um, a lot of them aren't apparent to a player that doesn't have at least a degree of system mastery. Yeah. I guess like when when I um when I soloed it last time I was a multi-class I think I was a half elf thief enchanter. No, no, I was just I was just an enchanter. Cause I wanted to see if I could get through as a character with like no offensive capabilities. And it is doable. Because mm -hmm. mm. the way that uh, mages work is that you can... A normal mage starts with one spell. Like we were saying, it's it's Vancy and magic. Which means that you... Every time you rest, you pick the spell to memorize. And it, you can then set that off at any time. But once it's gone, it's gone until you rest again. 
in the same way that like Dark Souls makes you attune magic at the bonfire. It's a similar system. Um, but basically it's like one shot per spell. Yeah. If you specialize as a mage, you pick a school of wizardry, of which I think there are eight. And that lets you get one extra spell, but it locks out the opposing school. And the um the exact like what spell belongs to what school is not necessarily intuitive because like the base magic missile spell that you uh, just lets you shoot a missile like that's caught that's an evocation spell but then when you start getting to second level spells there's a spell called acid arrow that shoots like an acid bolt but that's considered a conjuration spell which is different to evocation and it gets quite (laughs) quite complex yeah, yeah, we didn't really cover the intricacies of the magic system because otherwise yeah. we, 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 we would just have yeah. to do a podcast on that. It's just too much. Um, mm. But yeah, it's uh, it takes it takes time to learn because uh, not just because it's complicated, which it absolutely is, but also because it's not intuitive. A lot of these divisions feel arbitrary. Yeah. So, Tutu, could you tell us about the story of Baldur's Gate? Okay, so as we were talking about, Baldur's Gate takes place in the Forgotten Realms. And when you're making uh, the character, you're making a character who has a history, uh, who has a place in the world, even though it's very uh, broadly defined. You're making the uh, foster child of a mage named Gorion, who has raised you in the in Candlekeep, it's basically Candlekeep is imagine a cross between a fortress and a library, and it's um, it's uh, this little uh, village populated mostly by monks and archivists, and he has raised you there. You don't know who your real parents were, um, and yeah, you haven't really been an adventurer so far uh, by the yeah. time. Can can we pause for a second and talk about the oddness of this though? Because this is something that really struck me when I played it. Mm. Because you're this is like the I guess the issue with them saying you have a predefined history, but also make your own character is that as far as the game is concerned, you grew up in a library and didn't see the outside world. But also, your character can be a master of forest camouflage who talks to yes, animals. Yes, that's very weird. The, yeah. The, the, yeah. <laughs> the way the, the, the opening of the game is structured, it kind of feels like it favors a narrower amount of builds than what you can actually yeah. make. Especially uh, when you start adding stuff like the kits. And, and all this other stuff that was introduced in Baldur's Gate and then backported to Baldur's Gate, uh, when, sorry, added in Baldur's Gate 2 and then backported in Baldur's Gate 1. Like, you can make an half orc uh, uh, specialized warrior that has learned, like, these ancient war traditions, but who also has never ventured outside of this library. So that's kind of really strange. Yeah. Um, or a barbarian who is, like, illiterate. <laughs> yes. But was raised by librarians. It's... Garion just didn't give a shit. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. I guess we can start from the intro cinematic. Uh, just very, very quickly, you see this figure clad in this very 80s, 90s design of fantasy armor with a skull helm and a ton of spikes. And he's... It's very Warhammer. Yes. He's got, like, these yeah. giant shoulder pads. He's, he's a towering figure. And there's another person who is sort of chasing at the top of the rooftops of, of the rooftop of this tall medieval building. And they exchange some words, like the threatening figure explains that he's gonna be the last. And uh, the other person tries to bargain uh, uh, and save himself in some way, but gets kicked off the railing of the building, splashes onto the ground, pool of blood. Baldur's Gate starts. There's also a Nietzsche quote. I'm not going to repeat it because I don't think I don't think it has actually anything to do thematically with the story. No, at all. They just think it sounds cool. Yeah, pretty much. Is it the same one they use in Diablo? I think I it is. I don't know, actually. 
It might be. The abyss gaze is also. It might be. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. that. It's that. Yeah. It's it's kind of the edgy teenager Nietzsche yeah, quote. Yeah. It's the one everyone going through their goth phase uses. And my my fifty year old uh, uncle who keeps posting <laughs> keeps posting Nietzsche quotes on Facebook, but curiously they're always the quote you get as your first Google result if you search for Nietzsche quotes. Which suggests you may not have actually read Nietzsche. <laughs> Continue. I mean, to be fair. <laughs> to be fair. Anyway, um, so as we've established, the story starts with you having a pretty fine story and not knowing about your heritage. And it starts specifically at a point in time during which Gorion has told you basically that you have to leave Candlekeep for the first time and in a hurry. So what you do at the start of the game is sort of you do a bunch of tutorial stuff and then eventually you meet up Gorion and you leave Candlekeep. Um, after you leave Candlekeep, you get a cutscene. Um, by the way, before this, Gorion mentions that in case something happens to him, uh, you should uh, go to the Friendly Arm Inn to meet his friends, Jahira and Khalid. And there is some foreshadowing about uh, two things. One is there's a lot of talk on the, on the prophecies of the return of the god Pal who is the god of murder, and who is apparently gonna uh, be raised to life again by his progeny. Uh, so just very briefly, the Time of Troubles were a time where the lord of the gods, Ao, decided that the gods didn't care enough about what they were doing, so they were cast uh, into the mortal plane of existence as mortals, and they basically fought a bunch between themselves uh, until he decided he had enough and he made them gods again, but dependent on the faith of people. So basically, this is uh, a way the, set, the creators of D&D, the, the people that worked at TSR, used to explain the different pantheon between AD&D 1st edition and 2nd edition in the Forgotten Realms. But it also means that there are adventure seeds in there concerning like dead gods and their legacies and what happened during that period. Anyway, there's uh, references to that, to the death of Baal, and there's references to tensions rising between the city of Baldur Baldur's Gate, which is a city-state, and the nation of Am, and they might go at war. And this will become important later. Uh, so anyway, you live with Gorion. Uh, he warns you about having to go meet his friend in case he dies. And of course, you get ambushed by the same figure from the intro cinematic. Uh, he wants you, he doesn't want Gorion. Gorion refuses, they fight, and in the end he dies. So you manage to escape, but you've lost your father figure. So, um, at this point, um, there's the intro we've talked about before, where you're in this wooded area, and there's a bunch of enemies, you can meet a bunch of companions at this point. Uh, you go to the friendly army, in, and then you meet Khalid and Jahira. And here the game does something that I think is kind of strange in terms of storytelling. Because basically there are reasons as to why you cannot pursue the immediate conflict. But they don't put them at the forefront of your mind. Instead they just tell you, okay, there's an iron crisis in the region. We're going to go to Nashkel, uh, a village to the south of here. Uh, which is part of the nation of Am, and we're going to investigate the mines. So at this point, uh, the main quest becomes uh, a series of investigations, which is really kind of overselling it because it's mostly dungeon crawling where you find notes at the end. Yeah. And in the meantime, while you go through these locations, you start learning that there's a bounty on your head and you start having some kind of prophetic dreams that mm. seem to be related to murder. Also, as a result uh, of, the, the, of the bounty, like, there are NPC assassin characters who will, like, be waiting for you in certain cities to just try killing yeah, you. Yeah, yes. Yes, there yeah. are some very memorable early game encounters, very memorable, and let's again, say, beef games. They, they can, like, really, really mess you up as well because of the way the low-level D&D combat works. Because I remember, like... When you get to the friendly army, and there is just a mage who will try to kill you, and um, that yeah. mage has like magic missile spells that can't miss, and if they target you, 
instead of your traveling companions, your character dies and you get game over and have to do the whole thing again. Yeah. Yeah. The start of Baldur's Gate is not easy. Mm. Uh, at least uh, if you don't know how to navigate. Yeah, well, uh, it, the ADM, it's the odd because it's roles. like, it's not easy, but it's also all just based on probability. So it's not so much that like, like obviously knowing your way around and understanding how combat works is going to help you, but you can also just get bad rolls and there's nothing you can do about it. Mm-hmm. Like if if yeah. you run into a bunch of orcs and they all decide to shoot your main character, then it's game over and you can't really do anything yeah. about it. Yeah, it's it's kind of one of the oddities of adapting uh, a rule set like that digitally because first of all you can reload yeah. every time you die, so a lot of the permanent consequences don't actually happen, and secondly, uh, in a real life uh, uh, scenario, often a DM will actually not use the rules that they get will just fudge the numbers yeah. a little bit to create just yeah. enough tension. That's what I used to but do. But without killing. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, uh, so we've established that there's a bounty and assassins, is a- are assassins are hunting you. And we have prophetic dreams that sort of are themed uh, uh, around murder. Uh, in the meantime, while investigating uh, through a series of locations, you learn that an organization called the Iron Throne is uh, basically manufacturing an iron shortage in the, re- in the region. What they are doing, which I think is very interesting, and it's probably the most sophisticated part of the storytelling in Baldur's Gate, in my opinion, is they, and they use this term, by the way, in the game, I didn't make it up, it's just not me being illiterate, poison the, the ore, the iron ore, through a, a substance, so that the iron is brittle, it either cannot be used completely to make weapons, or the weapons and armors that are made uh, are very brittle. And this is something that is reflected in the gameplay, mm. by the way. Yeah, when you, you start you, the game, you have a bunch of uh, iron weapons, iron armors that just sometimes break while you're fighting or adventuring. And it's very, very annoying. But it's cool that it's reflected in, in gameplay. Um, so you discover that the Iron Throne is uh, doing this. They are also cutting caravans that are trying to reach Baldur's Gate with iron from other regions through the use of bandits. And these bandits attacks, uh, these bandit attacks are blamed on another organization altogether, uh, the Zentarim, uh, who are a crime syndicate and part of the Forgotten Realms lore and one of the examples of how Bioware uses the lore. And uh, in the meantime, they have their own mine uh, that they can use to mine good iron. And so they are kind of positioning themselves as uh, essentially the only people who are providing iron in the region. While also start, well, they are also starting to heighten the tensions between Amn and Baldur's Gate so that the city of Baldur's Gate will want to commission to buy as much iron as they can to make weapons and armor. Uh, so this is all very grounded. It, it's hard at this point to understand how prophecies of gods fit into this. Mm. Well, um, <laughs> I, I think, like, basically because it's so adherent to, like, the sort of Joseph Campbell hero's journey thing. It's even though they don't tell you, I think it's kind of obvious from the beginning that, like, oh, I don't know who my true parents are, and I was raised as an orphan, and everyone's talking about like this. This god had a yes, bunch of children. I mean, obviously, uh, I expect <laughs> the people listening to us to get it. Yeah. In fairness, I played it when I was like eleven or twelve, so it genuinely didn't. Yeah. Like I genuinely did not realize that at the time, but I was very young. Um, but, uh, yes, there's a lot of foreshadowing about, yeah. like, your true heritage. But what I think is interesting is how these two plots mixed. Because the person who is chasing you, um, who is sending the assassins after you, and the person who tried to ambush you, his name is Saravok. He's a member of the Iron Throne, is kind of in control of some of their operations, and, um, well, um... I'm just gonna spoil it because it's kind of obvious. Is your half brother 
by way of Baal, the god of murder. So he, he, he obviously is more aware of his heritage than you are and has an interest in that. Um, but uh, it takes a while before you get there. So you complete the investigation and you get to Baldur's Gate. And this is quite a ways into the game. And inside Baldur's Gate, you gain the trust of one of the dukes who govern the city uh, and controls the Iron Fist mercenaries that are basically the guards in the city and in the region. And he sends you on an investigation uh, for into the matter of the Iron Throne. And while investigating the Iron Throne, you learn that basically all of, the, all of their leaders are actually backing Candlekeep to have some kind of meeting. And so you decide to go there. It gives you... Uh, you couldn't go back to Candlekeep before because you need a book to enter, a rare book. So it gives you a rare book and it sends you there. So, okay, this... I'm not going to mince words. is my least favorite part of the game. Um, it's not because it's necessarily because it's railroady, but because how the railroading is done, that it's very bad. So you enter Candlekeep. Um, you meet the Iron Throne leaders. You can decide whether you want to kill them or not, uh, but it doesn't matter because a figure called Coverus, which astute, astute listeners might have noticed is just Saravok turned backwards. <laughs> <laughs> it's especially obvious because like, you see it written down in the dialogue. Yes. And it's very clearly just Saravok backwards. If they, if they at least had just voice acting, they could kind of sell it. But this game relies so much on reading that it doesn't yeah, work. Yeah, yeah. It frames you for the killing of the leaders, which happens either way, whether you do it or not. And so you get arrested by the guards. One thing I should mention here is that um, at this point in the game, you're told by a monk, oh, you can go to the old room of Gorion. And there you find a note that mentions that basically Gorion knew your mother, um, that she had a child of Baal, and that he decided to take care of you in memory of her, and that he wanted to tell you about uh, this. But uh, if he couldn't do it, then he left a note just to be sure, you know, the usual stuff. What's interesting to me is that you can technically miss this note. Now, it's not easy. You will pro most players will probably get it. But I think it's, even though I don't think they were intentionally being ballsy, I think it's kind of ballsy that they leave the big reveal about your nature that, again, um, it's very strongly hinted, um, but uh, it's still interesting to me compared to later Bioware games that it, they leave this to a note, first of all, and that the note can be missed. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, the way I see it is that when they were developing Baldur's Gate, their storytelling style was still very much in the mind of a dungeon master. And when you're a dungeon master, when you're telling your players all this kind of stuff, it doesn't really matter if you're playing a character or reading to them a note, because you're both doing the same thing in your voice. And Baldur's Gate also didn't have much voice, voice acting. There are really only a few lines of voice acting. So. Um, I think it works in the context of the game, uh, but I think it's understandable why they moved away from that style. But it makes it very, very interesting to me. Uh, both that and the focus for so much of the game about a grounded plot, about kind of political and economic intrigue. Anyway, you're framed for the murder of the Iron Throne leaders. Um, uh, you get arrested, thrown in jail. Um, the thing that makes the backwards name thing even more annoying is that a monk comes to save you, right? And you can mention to him, did you know about this Coveras dude? And he goes, hmm, never heard of him before, but that's Saravok backwards. Dun, dun, dun. <sighs> and it's like... <laughs> mm. Well, the, the other... <laughs> The other strange part about this whole system is, like, how does the legal system even function in this world? Where you can, like, there's just a spell that detects evil, and also you can make yourself invisible and, like, control people's minds. Like, I have no idea how a legal system even functions. I have no idea. To be yeah. honest, that's 
always been a huge problem with world building in Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah, because it's like it's we were that- saying, like it's it's pitched at a very specific level, and if you try to go outside of those boundaries, you start getting into very awkward situations. Basically, what they do is they want to evoke the image of medieval Europe uh, yeah. that exists in the mind of people, but without really thinking, first of all, how medieval Europe actually works, because medieval Europe without Christianity does not work. Mm. You you cannot have that kind of polytheistic medieval Europe that they present there, uh, or at least you need to justify it. You need to do a lot of the work developing the culture, with the which the Forgotten Realms doesn't do. And secondly, like, they have such a high level of magic that you would think society would be profoundly affected by all these things that yeah. can be done. But it isn't. Why do they even need iron? Yeah. Like, <laughs> can, can, can someone just make it? Uh, yeah. But you, you're not supposed to think about this kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you, you, you just accept D&D for what it is. And this is not a flaw, by the way, necessarily for Bioware themselves and how they develop the story as much as it is a flaw of the Forgotten Realms themselves and really most D&D settings with some rare exceptions. Like, I have never played it myself, but I know Eberron is well known for having a lot of work put into yeah. thinking about how magic affects the world and that kind of stuff. Anyway, that was the worst part of the game, but now comes a better part, let's say, because this monk sends you with a spell to the catacombs under Candlekeep. And here you discover, first of all, there were a bunch of, um, if you haven't discovered it already through gameplay, there were a bunch of doppelgangers working for Saravok in Candlekeep, and you now you have to fight a bunch of them in this do you want, we should explain what a doppelganger is in D and D terms. Because mm-hmm. uh, yeah. well, I mean, it's kind of intuitive. It's a it's a type of creature that can take uh, the appearance of another person and uh, emulate them, like their voice, their appearance. Um, they they are shown in Candlekeep studying the mannerisms of the people they kill, so that they can act like them. They do a really bad job, by the way. The dialogue goes so heavy with the foreshadowing that you're kind of forced yeah. to uh, assume that everyone in Candlekeep is an idiot. Lol. But yeah, you fight a bunch of them in the catacombs of Candlekeep. And then you have this really this encounter that I think is actually kind of brilliant, uh, even though it's easy to guess that it's doppelgangers, because you meet Elminster... Elminster, I should explain who he is. Elminster is an NPC in the Forgotten Realms. It's kind of the Forgotten Realms Gandalf. And is, I, I think I might be wrong, but he's based on the appearance of Ed Greenwood, the person that created the setting. Yeah, he's like a big, um, like, pot-bellied wizard with, like, a beard, basically. Yeah, pointy yeah. hat, all dressed like in Santa. red. Yeah. Yeah. And he basically appears throughout the game, giving you very obvious foreshadowing about what is going to happen. And you have some hilarious responses to him. Like, you can really rant at him uh, when he gives you cryptic foreshadowing, which I think is just amazing. And it's just one of those artifacts of uh, the developers being... uh, at their first RPG and the fact that there wasn't like a lot of stuff like documentation and dialogue guidelines that existed at Bioware, it meant that the dialogue was more uneven, but also people kind of did whatever they want with the dialogue. And you could have like a full paragraph response where you threaten the minster in all kinds of colorful ways. Uh, but anyway, you meet doppelgangers for Elminster and Gorion. And what they tried to sell to you is that actually you were killing real people, you're under some kind of illusion spell that made you perceive them as uh, um, as doppelgangers, and that Gorion didn't really die, but used some kind of spell to preserve himself. Um, so the thing is, uh, this kind of twist, your mentor isn't really dead, we used magic to keep him alive, could work in a D&D setting. So even though all the circumstantial evidence leads you to believe 
yeah, these are really just doppelgangers, it kind of puts the doubt in your head, or at least it did to me a little bit, which I think works quite well and is one of the neatest narrative moments in this dungeon. Um, anyway, you defeat, of course, all of these people and get out. You're still hunted technically, by the mercenaries, the Flaming Fist mercenaries, but you have to go back to Baldur's Gate. And you have to go back to Baldur's Gate because now uh, Sarevok um, has basically arranged to become one of the Dukes of Baldur's Gate with the political power he has accrued. And uh, he wants to lead the city in a war with Am, uh, which is something that the other leaders of the Iron Throne didn't really want to do. They just wanted to raise the tensions a little bit so that people would buy iron, but otherwise, then they wanted kind of the, the tensions to go away. Um, uh, so, uh, because I'm doing a summary, I didn't really have the chance to talk about Sarevok's background, but you learn most of it in a diary that you get if you do uh, an optional side quest in Baldur's Gate when you return. And basically, basically, you already know that Sarevok, if you paid attention to the notes in the various places you investigated, Sarevok is the adoptive child of one of the leaders of the Iron Throne. And you might go, like, why did he kill his dad then? Well, it turns out that his dad uh, was an abusive dad who really, who really kind of assumed there was unfaithfulness on part of his mother because she had this child of Bol. This is strongly implied in the game, but it's technically never said. He just mentions in the diary that he thought his wife was unfaithful, and this gave them wiggle room later to retcon this. So I talked about the mother of the protagonist of the game, and I talked about the mother of um, um, Sarevok. Uh, but later on, they would retcon that stuff so that Sarevok's mother was an adoptive mother too, her biological mother was another person, and whatever Gorion has told you in your note was actually um, a lie that he came up with, and your real story is a little different. Uh, but uh, that's stuff that comes up later that I didn't think they had planned back when they made Baldur's Gate. Uh, like, I think it's just a retcon, it's not something that they plan to reveal. Anyway, Saravok has gone through all of this abuse as a child, so he has a lot of hatred for his, for his father, which is what moved him to kill him. And I think this gives Saravok a little bit more depth that otherwise it doesn't have, because it's really just kind of a very Saturday morning cartoon kind of villain who laughs a lot with a deep voice and has a very Warhammer armor. Because I can understand the fact that he was abused for his childhood wanting giving him this sense of needing to take back control. So I can understand his psychology. Uh, but basically, to cut the story short, what he wants to do, the reason he wants to have this war, is that he's hoping that all this blood that will be spilled um, um, will uh, eventually ascend him to godhood, will make him the new god of murder. Uh, by the way, I should have mentioned it earlier, but uh, the reason Gorion escaped from Candlekeep was that he noticed Sarevok investigating the prophecies of Baal uh, back when. Uh, and so he decided to leave the city to save you, and clearly it didn't work out. So you go to the ceremony, you unmask Sarevok, uh, defeat him and a bunch of doppelganger in battle, because apparently he also wanted to kill all of the dukes uh, to make sure that he had full control of the city for his doppelgangers. Unfortunately, he manages to escape, he gets saved by one of his henchmen, so you have to go down to the Undercity, where there's a Temple of Baal, and have the final fight there. And he has his full party of henchmen there. It's, it's a very difficult fight, especially because there's a bunch of traps in the final arena. So it's not just a plain fight, you also have to be careful of your surroundings. Uh, but as I mentioned before, there are a lot of strategies as to how to handle it. And you defeat Saravok, uh, you get the final cutscene. Um, his godly essence descends into the earth. You see this big kind of circular room with a lot of statues, each representing a different person. One of the statues is based on Saravok. The essence goes into, into the Saravok statue and destroys it. And this kind of 
if I have to really spell it out, this means there are a lot of uh, uh, children of Baal out there, and this will become a plot point. Weirdly yeah. enough, in, it will not become a plot point in, uh, uh, in Baldur's Gate 2. It will become a plot point in the expansion to Baldur's Gate 2. Baldur's Gate 2 is mostly a personal story about the villain that is just tangentially related to, to, to Baal in the sense that he wants yeah. your essence. They do um, foreshadow the villain in Baldur's Gate 1 using one of the charm dialogues, but it's extremely yes. obscure. Yeah, and they, they yeah, give him a different name, but it's, yeah. There's this lady that's kind of bloated in the Forest of Clockwood that's basically a place full of spiders. And um, what happens is basically you can, I think also from her normal dialogue, you can learn that she was made that way from a mage named John Icarus, uh, which was changed to John Irenicus in Baldur's Gate 2, and was then uh, and then in the announced edition they retcon the dialogue, they change Icarus to Irenicus. Um, I don't, to be honest, I don't know if they were intentionally foreshadowing the plot. I know they had done at least some planning as to their future games, because, for example, development of Neverwinter Nights started during the development of Baldur's Gate, even though it was released much later. And there was talk of going to Amn uh, in the future. There's a character that's called, I shit you not, Lord Foreshadow, that gives you some yeah. of this information. <laughs> um, but I know that John Icarus was a character that... Um, one of the one of the bio developers used during one of their uh, D and D campaigns, uh, so that's where the idea for the character comes from. So I don't know if they always meant to have him be the villain, or if it's an idea that came afterwards. Oh. Hmm. I feel like Baldur's Gate has given us a lot to think about. <laughs> <laughs> Richie, do the outro! Yeah. That was a discussion of the classic Bioware Infinity Engine D&D &D game, Baldur's Gate, with special guest Beautiful Bear in a Tutu. Uh, beautiful Bear in a Tutu, would you just like to reiterate where people can find you if they're interested in classic CRPGs? Yeah, thank you. So I do have a Twitter account where I post a bunch of scattered brain thoughts on video games and other subjects. <laughs> uh, recently, I have been ranting for a very long time about the game Vampire. Which I implore you, I implore you not to play, don't do that to yourself. I did it so you didn't have to. Um, but yeah, my Twitter account is at the real tutu bear. Um, I also have a Twitch account which I haven't been using much to stream recently, which is twitch.tv slash beautiful bear in a tutu. And I guess I'm also on Discord, for example, if you're on the. Uh, Snack Covenant Discord. Uh, I am there. Uh, getting mad about Hideo Kojima. <laughs> Alright, well, thank you so much for coming, Tutu. Thank you so much for having me. It was fun. It was it was a great experience. Thank you. Aww. Say thank you, Richie. Thank you, Richie. <laughs> <laughs> also, thank you, Bear. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me and for having this discussion and for helping direct direct me when I was meandering too much. Oh. <laughs> okay. I'm gonna press stop now, but nobody leaves this room. <laughs> <laughs>